Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming today. I'm Ludovica Grifanti. I'm a biomedical engineer. And uh, many of you may remember me from the MRI control room. Um, so I've seen um, some of you uh, who volunteered for our brain MRI scan. And so I want to show you today uh, what new insights into Parkinson's we got from your time, from your 45 minutes in the scanner. So why did we include imaging in OPDC in the first place? Well, because imaging is effectively a window on the living brain. So wh what we wanted out of um, our imaging study was to look at how the brain is affected by this disease, uh, so understand the mechanisms uh, of Parkinson's. Uh, we wanted to um, be able to um, see and to uh, identify who is most likely to develop Parkinson's among people that are at risk, or even within people um, that have Parkinson's, um, can we see uh, who is going to progress faster, slower, who is going to get dementia. Uh, we want to identify who is more li most likely to benefit uh, from therapy. And so within a possible clinical trial, trying to be able to monitor the brain, the living brain, and see whether the uh, treatment is working. So out of all the imaging methods, why MRI? Uh, well, because MRI is non-invasive, so there is no radiation involved, and it's quite safe. So once we um, um, made uh, sure that you that there is no metal in the body because this uh, the scanner is basically a huge magnet so it's dangerous if there is metal in the body but otherwise it's perfectly safe because this technique is available at more most large hospitals so it can be easily applied in clinical practice it's very versatile. I will try to convince you today that we can look at many different characteristics of the brain uh, just with one scanner and also, the time um, of the scan is quite feasible. Uh, actually, you are the proof that you all made it through the scans. And um, actually, because in parallel, the technology behind MRI is growing and is improving a lot, we are sure that if we need to uh, put this method in a clinical setting, we can cut down the, cut down the times even more. So thanks to your 45 minutes, 379 times. Um, so we got this much amount of scans uh, out of almost 300 people because some of you uh, volunteered to undergo one scan with us, but now we are calling back people for a second scan because we want not only to see how the brain looks like when it has or doesn't have Parkinson's, but also how it changes over time. And so out of uh, these almost 300 people, half of them have Parkinson's, and uh, some of them have some genetic risk of Parkinson's that we also want to study a little bit more in detail. A quarter uh, of the people have RBD, and the remaining quarter have, uh, are, uh, they don't have um, neither PD or RBD. And so what I'm gonna, go to, I'm gonna do today is to go through the 45 minutes in the scanner uh, once again, hoping that the experience wasn't too traumatic, and show you what we were looking at while you were in the scanner, and what type of data we collected, how we analyzed them, and what we found, or what we are trying to find. So first of all, uh, we position you in the scanner, uh, and we say that we are ready to start, please keep your eyes open and try not to fall asleep. Because we want to look at the brain while it's awake. Sleep is a completely different state. And this is because we look at brain function. So the brain is always active. Even if we are not doing anything, even if we are uh, just lying uh, calmly in the scanner. And uh, also the brain activity and the blood that flows into the brain to maintain this activity changes over time. And also as a consequence, the magnetic properties of the brain tissues change over time. And that's what we can detect with MRI. So what we do is during the first 10 minutes, we uh, take many, many pictures of the brain, 180, and we look at the intensity at the signal that we get in MRI over time. And the idea is that if two brain regions have the same changes, the same fluctuation in uh, signal in MRI, it means to us that they are working together, that they are active together, they support the same function. And so we can group brain regions together into brain networks, 
and study their activity. And in Parkinson's, one of the most important networks of the brain is what we call basal ganglia network. So the basal ganglia are affected, uh, is a, are a key set of regions that are affected by Parkinson's. And so we want to have a look at the function of the brain um, in these regions. And as you may remember from previous open days, Harry and Tom um, showed you these results showing that in people with Parkinson's and with RBD, we saw a decrease in brain function in this specific network. What I can update you on is the fact that even when we increase the number of um, data that we collect, the difference is still there. Uh, it doesn't have the sensitivity of the other types of biomarker that we saw so far, uh, but there is a difference. We can say that there is a decreased function uh, in Parkinson's and RBD. And so maybe it, alone it cannot be the biomarker, but overall in the big picture it can contribute um, to increase our um, ability to detect Parkinson's. Then uh, we check that everything is doing well. And then we don't look at the function of the brain anymore, so we, you can keep your eyes open or closed, you can uh, have a nap, and we can put some music on just to make the rest of the scan less boring. But as you may remember, our scanning facilities is a bit of a dungeon. So we have reception only for classic FM or radio too. <laughs> and so that's the limited choice that we have, so that's the question that you get. Uh, but so while you listen to the music, we look at brain anatomy. So this time, uh, we take only three pictures of the brain, but they are very, very detailed because we want to look at the anatomy, at the structure of the brain. And as you can see, they look quite different. Uh, and this is because, again, by tweaking the settings of the scanner, we can be um, sensitive to different um, characteristics of the brain. And what we do, we extract automatically some measures um, out of the scans. We can quantify the amount of the different types of brain tissues. We can look at the dimension and the shape of the basal ganglia, the key structures that are affected in Parkinson's. And also we can look at some hyperintensity, some disruptions of the microvasculature of the brain. Uh, what we found so far is that actually all these uh, anatomical measures are quite normal for age. So we didn't find a, an actual fingerprint of Parkinson's in the structure of the brain. But these measures are still very useful to um, acquire and to measure because we want to be able to say what's, um, what changes over and above the effect of age. So we need to know what's the effect of age in first place and then trying to disentangle what's left. Uh, and also, even just um, when we measure uh, brain function, um, if someone has a decreased brain function, we need to be able to tell whether it's just because they had a slightly smaller head or just because it, it is an actual decrease of function. Then we check again that everything is going well, and uh, then we warn you that is the noisy part of the scan. Uh, and we say that you may feel the bed slightly vibrating, but it's absolutely normal which it is, uh, because what we need to do is to look at the brain microstructure. So we go one level deeper, we need to push the power of our scanner even more, and hence more noise, a little bit of vibration. And we do that because um, we want to um, look at the microstructure of the brain in uh, three different tissues. Uh, so the main components of the brain are the cerebrospinal fluid, so the liquid that fills up um, all the space. The gray matter, which contains the bodies of the neurons where the activation starts. And then the white matter, which contains the wiring, the axons that connect um, all the brain regions. What we do with diffusion MRI, this is the name of the technique, is to look at how the brain, uh, sorry, how the water moves in the brain, how the water diffuses. And in, this, in these three compartments, in the cerebral spinal fluid, the water will diffuse, very, uh, will diffuse a lot and in any direction. It's basically liquid, it's basically water. In the gray matter, the water diffuses a little bit less because there are some boundaries, there are the bodies of the neurons. But still, the direction is quite homogeneous. The interesting bit is the fact that in the white matter, the water diffuses very, very little and along the axons, because that's the only direction that water can take. 
And this is what we are able to detect with MRI. We are able to detect the amount of water and where it flows. And this is how a diffusion MRI scan looks like. So the cerebrospinal fluid is still black, water flows all over the place. Gray matter, in the gray matter we have a, a little increase in intensity, uh, so there is less diffusion, but quite homogeneous, it doesn't really have a shape. Uh, but the white matter, here you can see a, a, a stripe of bright signal, this is a bundle of um, axons. So we are able to see where all the bundles in the brain go. And we are able to say and to measure how, um, how much they are um, preserved, if there is a, any disruption that could affect the connections across brain regions. And what we found, again, there is no a clear difference in terms of, there is no a signature of Parkinson's in the brain microstructure. But what we found is a link between the microstructure of the brain and the cognitive performance. So again, it, it tells us something about um, not the main symptoms of Parkinson's, but still something very, very um, useful and interesting to study. And finally, we say that we are almost done. Uh, we say there are only 13 minutes to go, and what we do in these final 13 minutes is looking at the brainstem. So um, as you may know, the um, Parkinson's um, disease starts from these regions, starts from lower down uh, in the brainstem. And um, in particular, we want to study the substantia nigra. So George uh, talked about this before. In the substantia nigra, we have dopaminergic neurons that are lost in Parkinson's. And um, the substantia nigra is called like this because it's dark, nigrum in Latin, um, in the healthy brainstem. And this uh, pigmentation is lost in Parkinson's. So these are post-mortem tissues. Can we see this in MRI? Well, the answer is yes. So we can see it in two ways. One is with this scan that actually highlights the substantia nigra as bright. And um, it may be hard to see um, in these pictures, but we can actually extract measures of how bright is the substantia nigra. And we can see that in uh, people without Parkinson's, it's very bright. An intermediate intensity in people with RBD and a lower intensity in people with Parkinson's. So we are able to detect the decrease of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. Another types of scan, again, we tweak a bit the settings, and we can see now the substantia nigra being black. But actually, what we can see is a bright dot uh, that is um, highlighted by the arrows, and um, that separates the black area into like what we call a swallowtail. So this is actually, it's been called swallowtail sign. So uh, the fact that there is this bright dot means that there is a nucleus, the um, nigrosome one, that contains dopaminergic neurons, again. And this sign is not visible in people with Parkinson's. So again, an, a loss of dopamine neurons. And what we did uh, was, um, again, acquiring this type of sequence in discovery, and we found that 92% of people without Parkinson's had this clear white dot. 30% um, of people with uh, RBD didn't have it. And 96% of people with Parkinson's didn't have it. So again, um, it could contribute uh, as a biomarker of Parkinson's. And we don't know yet, again, if these 30% 30 30 of people with RBD are those that are going to develop Parkinson's. And then, uh, that's all done. We say that we are coming and get you out. And we thank you for your time and um, for your patience. And I'm going to thank you once again for your time and for listening to me today. <laughs>